I usually don't speak at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. As a matter of fact, my typical remarks at 8 o'clock in the morning are things like, uh, gee, is the coffee ready yet, honey? Or uh, uh, is my favorite blue shirt uh, back from the cleaners? Or, uh, uh-oh, we better get some toilet paper added to the grocery list. <laughs> so those are my uh, comments for this morning, and I thank you very much. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, since we're going to be talking a little bit about the movie business, since that's kind of the field we're in here at Dove, uh, I, how many of you remember the movie It's a Wonderful Life? I remember that. Okay, a uh, little uh, movie trivia for you. Uh, do you know what happens when a bell rings? An angel gets his wings, that's right. Well, we're going to play a variation of that here today. <laughs> and that is that if a cell phone rings, the Dove Foundation gets a $100 donation from the owner of the phone. How's that? <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, Jeffrey, uh, when he asked me to, to uh, speak today, I uh, suggested that he introduce me as this. But unfortunately, my request was drowned out by hysterical laughter from my wife. So we decided that that probably wasn't the best uh, uh, introduction for me. But I, I would like to, again, play a little game with you and see if you're wide awake this morning. And if you can tell me which of these two fellas are the smartest guy in the room. Any idea? Well, if you had an idea, you could be in bad shape because neither one of them is smarter than the other, right? Because they're both uh, talking on their cell phones. How about these two? Uh, which is the smarter in the room? The one who's talking or the one who's listening? John? Everybody say listening. Who says listening? Who says talking? Well, listening gets it, right. It's actually the person who talks the least is the smartest guy in the room. Isn't that right? Because that person knows not only what he knows, but he knows what the person talking knows. So he leaves uh, the smartest guy in the room. Unfortunately, that means that my title after I'm done speaking today will be the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> so anyway, um, I appreciate this. And we're going to be talking about the uh, eight C's of C-level leadership. And I'm going to begin this morning by kicking off and talking about operational values. Uh, these are the motivators, the, the whys and the wherefores and the things that, um, that motivate us to do the types of uh, things we do. And then this, the uh, second and third sessions are going to be talking about operational strategies. And my very good friends and colleagues down here, uh, Dave Nemmer, Henry Morley, and John Langford, are going to do a deep dive into the uh, operational uh, strategies, which are the tools that you'll use and take away uh, to improve your revenues and uh, increase your profits. Now, if that doesn't keep you here, nothing will. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when I started college, uh, I, we uh, were unfortunately hit with a tragedy, and so we didn't, I didn't get a chance to finish college. And I'll talk a little bit more about that near the end of my talk, because Jeffrey's asked me to share my personal story. Uh, so I had to find other ways to uh, learn what I needed to know uh, in order to do the work that I felt uh, God wanted me to do. So I began reading vociferously and I read everything I could get my hands on, including uh, Peter Drucker's Management by Objectives. How many remember MBO? Huh? Uh, but I also found that uh, sometimes the simpler versions uh, are also worth considering. And uh, I uh, oh, a great deal of gratitude to Ken Blanchard for the One Minute Manager. Uh, an interesting little anecdote, when my son was 19 years old, uh, he became the youngest uh, general manager of a Radio Shack store in the history of the company. So he called me up the day he got the promotion. He was down in uh, Bourbonnet, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. And he said, Dad, he said, I'm really excited for this opportunity, but I've got a problem. Uh, he said, uh, I've got a 49-year-old assistant manager, a female. And he said, 
I've not had any management experience before, so what do you recommend? And so I immediately recommended Ken Blanchard's One Minute Manager. And I asked him a couple of days later, I said, how'd it go for you? And he says, well, it went really well until she came up with a book called The 59 Second Employee, How to Stay One Second Ahead of the One Minute Manager. <laughs> and there is, that is a real book, by the way. So, and then among the, my favorite uh, gurus in management uh, and uh, management science is a guy by the name of Mark Miller, uh, who is uh, one of the executives at Chick-fil-A. Uh, Mark has a great program called Great Leaders Serve, and he's written a book called The Secrets of Leadership, and he has a book out now called Chess Not Checkers, uh, but his rule on serving is uh, fivefold. See the future, engage uh, and develop others, uh, reinvent continuously, uh, value results in relationships, and embody the values. And since uh, values are the kind of the leaping off place here, I thought that was a good place for me to start talking about values. Um, I'm, I'm given a limited amount of time, so I want to let you know that what you're going to get is uh, kind of information through a fire hose, but I'm hoping that a few droplets of water will uh, saturate your spirits and you'll be able to take a few uh, gems with you uh, by the end of the day. Um, by the way, I normally, about this time, I take my watch off and I put it in front of me. Uh, and I did that the first time that my wife attended a meeting and the lady next to her asked, she said, well, what's the significance of Dick taking his watch off? And she said, well, I'm sorry, but for my husband, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> but in this case, it does mean something. <laughs> and, and just to make sure, uh, Jeffrey put a, a little clock up here for me. So I promise not to uh, keep you over time. If I get that back up there where it belongs, there we go. So we're going to talk about operational values, and the first one is competence. Uh, do you do it well? And then creativity, are you flexible? Compassion, do you consider others? Character, do you do it with integrity? Commitment, are you dedicated? Collaborative, are you a team leader and a team player? Communication, do you keep everyone in the loop? And the ultimate C, who do you report to? And this will be part of my own personal story that I'll share later. Now, uh, Henry and Dave are going to be speaking on three of those areas in terms of, again, the uh, operational strategies, and those are competence, collaborative, and communication. And then John is going to come up and add a ninth C, and he's going to do a deep dive into the customer, which, of course, we're all we all report to. So uh, that'll be an interesting presentation and I'm gonna stay here so that I can redeem my position as the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> so, and I encourage you all to stay the same. <laughs> when it comes to competency, the one thing that I've found is that, uh, in my experience, is that it's oftentimes measured uh, by uh, process and that is uh, we have a tendency to look back on uh, how we did this past year. So we'll do a, um, uh, a, a one-year evaluation or uh, you do an employee evaluation or you will um, look at uh, comparing how your sales were from this year to a year ago. And frankly, I find my, in, in our experience, if you look back too far, it's like trying to drive a car forward looking out of the rearview mirror you're not gonna really progress if you continually look back. Now there's nothing wrong with looking back, but I would encourage you to look back uh, in more of what I call a prepared way or a proactive way. That is to begin looking back incrementally uh, and not uh, at a big uh, time frame or a big span. We've had this experience at the Dove Foundation. There have been many times, for example, when we got caught behind the eight ball because we waited too long in evaluating our progress uh, and looking at where our competencies were. One example of that was, uh, if any of you remember the, the words or the initials VHS, or we got some old folks here, you remember VHS? Okay. And, and you could go into a Meyer store and you could rent a movie, uh, or you could go to Family Video and rent a video. Well. 
uh, that's when we got our start. Uh, as a matter of fact, back in the old days, uh, this was before, really old days, was before the internet, because we were founded in 1990. So we used to fax copies of the movies that we had approved for the last ye a week to the video stores around the country that carried Dove sections in their stores. Um, and that worked out very well, and we were very complacent with that model. Then all of a sudden, about 96, something big happened, and that is the DVD came out and put VHS away. Well, we weren't ready for that transition, and as a result of that, it took us almost a year to get to the point where instead of talking to video stores about putting Dove Seals on the videos, we were talking to the studios and the manufacturers about putting Dove Seals on the DVDs as they were being manufactured. That was a whole different uh, paradigm for us, and it took us a long time to catch up. So we learned from that lesson that we have to be incremental thinkers, uh, and we have to be very proactive. So uh, it's always good to look at uh, these things um, uh, much like an R&D model. So uh, we, we constantly are reviewing and looking at the next thing that's happening in the industry. Uh, and if you're familiar with the term BHAG, uh, which is uh, the big, hairy, audacious goal. And you always want to have that in front of you and measure your competency based on how well you are adapting to the marketplace, not just what you did uh, last year or last month. And so uh, what we try to do is to continually improve uh, as we go. I remember another time as a, as a student in high school, uh, I was a, a high jumper in school and the scissors kick was the big thing back then. Again, I don't know how many of you here remember that, but that was how you got over the bar. You used a scissors kick. And then uh, along about my senior year, a guy came along and developed a thing called the Western Roll. Well, that put me out of the running immediately. I, I couldn't learn the Western Roll, so I was scissor kicking myself into oblivion while all the, the uh, awards were going to the guy in the Western Roll. And then, of course, uh, that was followed up uh, by a guy by the name of Dick Fosby, who came out uh, in 1968 uh, at the Olympics and developed the Fosbury flop, uh, which is now the, the, the new way to win records in high jump. All that to say that uh, competency is a lot about adaptability. Uh, the next thing we want to deal with is uh, creativity. When you're talking about creativity, uh, this is part of your competency, and that is to be able to adapt uh, and to be able to keep pace with technology. Now, as I said before, when we were first starting in the 90s, technology was moving pretty slowly. But today, technology is moving at such a rapid pace that you almost have to think. You, you can't be on the leading edge anymore. You have to be on the bleeding edge uh, in order to stay and adapt to what's going on. How many of you are impacted by changes in technology on a regular basis? Pretty much everybody, yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, certainly what we found. So we found that uh, it's important to read the tea leaves, and by tea leaves, I'm referring to the trends, the ecosystems, and the audience. And look back and ahead and make sure that you're looking both ways at the same time and be inventive and flexible uh, as I said, when we started out, we started out with one seal, and that was the Dove Family Approved Seal. Then very quickly we found that the faith audience was interested in uh, learning about us and having us endorse products that had a Christian or a religious message to them. So we immediately adapted and we came up with two additional seals called the Faith Based and the Faith Friendly Seal. Well, that wasn't uh, too long and we couldn't sit on our laurels when all of a sudden the whole marketplace changed from tangible product to digital product. Um, I headed a summit two years ago uh, in uh, what is it, St. Louis, and in that summit we had all of the pundits standing together side by side, and they were predicting that uh, digital entertainment was probably five to seven years away. Well, that was two years ago. Uh, and uh, we never anticipated it was going to jump the way it did. So what we had to do was adapt, and right now we have one of two uh, digital programs 
at the Dove Foundation. One is called the Dove Theater, which is available on our website so that you can actually uh, watch a video on demand and stream it live right off of our website. And then uh, in another couple of months, we're going to have a, fa a faith and family version of Netflix. So you'll actually be able to subscribe uh, and binge on wholesome family movies. Somehow the word binge and wholesome family just doesn't quite, <laughs> quite fit, but it, it works anyway. So uh, the next thing is uh, character. Uh, do you do it with uh, integrity? And integrity is a big thing. We found that uh, the one thing that uh, we found in Hollywood that gained us favor with so many of the studio executives and the filmmaker was the two things that they miss most, and that's unconditional love and trust. And if you can provide those two things to them, uh, you're miles ahead. Uh, Reputation is, of course, what other people see, and character is who we are in the dark places. Uh, a friend of mine uh, heads up a, an organization, Michael Josephson, called the Josephson Inst Institute for Ethical Studies. And he has a program called the Character Counts Coalition, and these are the elements of character that he embraces and that he suggests. And these are used currently by school districts all across the country uh, by the United States Air Force Academy, the Boy Scouts of America, and the National YMCA. These are some very interesting precepts that ought to be considered, especially if you're looking at developing core values. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The next thing is compassion. Um, how compassionate are you? Now, compassion is different than respect. Uh, with compassion, these are the synonyms uh, with compassion, empathy, uh, fellow f f feeling, tenderness, care, concern, sensitivity. These are words that go much deeper than just simple respect. And people want compassion. This is the unconditional love issue that I was just referring to a minute ago. Now for externally, your, your customers and your clients and your audience certainly want that. Uh, and they want to know that you have that. Um, I have an, my own personal uh, experience with physicians, and that is that physicians aren't always the most compassionate, the most caring people on the planet. My apologies if there are any physicians present. Uh, I'm sure you're the exception to the rule. But uh, I've often wanted to create a sign and hang it into, uh, in one of my doctor's offices. And this is what the sign would say. <laughs> Patients are people too. Uh, because I think it's important for them to remember that we're not just a, a jumble of diagnosis, but that we're actually humans and uh, need to be treated uh, as humans with the same care and fellow feeling and love and respect uh, that they would like to be treated with. Now that's true on the uh, internal side, or the external side, but now on the internal side, when you're dealing with leadership and employees and colleagues, there's another banner that ought to be hanging in your office, uh, Mr. CEO or Ms. Uh, CEO or CFO, and that is employees are people too. We must never forget that our people are not just numbers, uh, they're not just names on a punch card uh, or uh, names on a paycheck, but they are people that have cares and concerns of their own, and it's up to us to identify with them and to empathize and to uh, feel uh, along with them. The uh, next one uh, we're going to talk about is commitment and how dedicated are you. Commitment is a funny thing. A lot of people think about commitment as being uh, um, determination, but determination is different from commitment. Commitment is the overarching ability to see the vision and to latch on to it and never lose sight of what the ultimate vision is. Determination is the step-by-step -step process that you go through in order to accomplish uh, the goal that you set out in the commitment. And some of the evidences that you see uh, in terms of uh, the commitment are attendance and punctuality, uh, com completing assignments on time, focusing on work, and going the extra mile. These are all indicators of people who really care and are committed 
to the corporation and to the corporate values. Uh, extra studies, personal and professional growth, volunteering in other organizations, those all are more than just add, on, add uh, to your uh, resume, but they are value added to your workplace and to your employer, and your employer will always respect the amount of time that you invest in your community as well as you invest in your work. Collaborative, this is an, another interesting term, I love this, because we're talking about teams and team players. I have a couple of great examples of collaborative. Um, first of all, every person, we must remember, adds value to the organization by the unique expertise that they bring to the table. A corporation, however, we must remember, is not a democracy. When we're talking about collaborative, we're talking about the, the, the CEO of the company or the person in charge of the company taking in respectfully all of the information and the input that he or she can get before making the ultimate decision. Uh, and that's what gives CEOs a, a unique perspective. Now, one example of collaborative, and I'm gonna read this because this actually came out of the script of the um, Star Trek movie, uh, version one, episode one. It says, in the original Star Trek movie, everyone is ready to set course, and Captain Kirk tells Sulu to proceed ahead at warp factor one. When asked that for the heading, Kirk simply says, out there, that away. With that, the Enterprise flies overhead and engages in warp drive on its way to another mission of exploration and discovery. Out there, that away? Um, not exactly the best way to uh, make a collaborative decision as an executive. But I have a personal experience that I'd like to share with you. When I was in the Navy, we had a skipper who understood the value of collaboration. He, was, he never saw himself as greater than any other person on board that ship, but he did know how to gather the information and make use of it. In this particular case, uh, I served on the USS Stribling, which is uh, 867 over there, and that's uh, during a Highline episode. But um, I can tell you that we were called to rescue the crew off of a tanker that had split in half off of the Cape of, uh, the Cape, of uh, Cape Hatteras, rather, the coast of Cape Hatteras. Say that fast three times. <clears throat> and um, in the process, we had to go after the after half and our sister ship went after the, the fore half. And there were crew members of, from the tanker on both sides. Now this was not an ordinary task because we were moving forward in 90 foot swells. That's 45 feet above sea level and 45 feet below sea level. Now to give you some perspective on that, the, the destroyer is 59 feet from the water level to the tip of the mast. <laughs> and we were going through 90 foot swells. Uh, and we had to get there. Time was of the essence because we had to rescue this, uh, these crew before their ship capsized and they were lost. So the, the skipper, uh, being, again, a wise uh, commander, went to every single department on that ship and called all of the leaders together and looked at things like wind speed and wind direction and um, all of the navigation. He had to make sure that the Highline crew was ready as soon as we got there because we were actually going to have to Highline the crew from the, tan from the tanker over to our ship. Now, if anybody knows anything about Highlining, uh, the object to highlining is to throw a line across and then that goes to a big, a heavier rope and then a basket goes across and then people get in the basket and are uh, ferried from ship to ship. Well, that's fine as long as the ships are rolling uh, in concert. But when this happens, uh, it becomes a whole nother game. And I can't tell you the thrill and excitement and nerves that are out there when you've got 50 guys running up and down the deck trying to take in the slack or let out the slack as the ships uh, between the stribbling and the tanker were rolling back and forth towards each other and away from each other. So uh, the skipper had to set course uh, and make sure that we got there in a timely fashion 
but he could only do it successfully after con contacting and, and getting advice from every single person on board. <coughs> Excuse me, communication is next, and this is about keeping everybody in the loop. Communication is a two-way process. Um, and when you're talking about internal communication, you're talking about communicating with your employees. Uh, and with uh, communication, uh, Janice Petrini, who is on my board and also a regular attender here at um, the uh, CBRT, uh, puts out a publication and she had what I thought were three excellent uh, points when it comes to communications. She said the great leaders communicate daily and offer feedback. You notice it's, it's a two-way process, right? Uh, she, they encourage employer, employees to participate in problem solving. It's a two-way conversation that encourages engagement. Externally, we also have to be careful and make sure that we communicate properly with the customer. <clears throat> and I'm sure Dave and uh, Henry are gonna uh, dive down more deeply on this topic too. But the important thing here is that we've got to remember that communicating with an employee or with, an, with a customer rather is more than just putting out sales slogans and ads and things like that. You really have to communicate personally with them <clears throat> and make sure that you're personalized, your attention to detail, uh, that you uh, uh, personalize in quality and timely service and that your personalized responsiveness to customers' needs and that you are proactive uh, to make up for messy mistakes. The um, other important thing about communicating is that it guides an employer's uh, ability, uh, a company's ability rather, to differentiate themselves from other organizations. Uh, if you understand who and what you are, uh, it makes it easy for you to distinguish yourself from your competition, which is always important. Uh, and uh, Ed Sinek, uh, a regular TED Talker, uh, had a comment that I thought was important. He says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Now this gets into another value that uh, I'm just gonna briefly touch on, and that is the whole core values issue. Uh, and uh, with this, um, uh, I'm gonna get a little bit of help. Uh, here is a comment from a CEO of a company dealing with core values. I used to think company core values and mission statements were corny and useless, and in most cases they're not much more than posters on a wall. At Vertical Nerve, however, we actively live by six core values in ways that really impact our clients. In fact, each week employees are nominated, rewarded, and publicly recognized for living out these core values. We're not perfect, but you can't expect us to live by the following values. Relentless. You'll be hard pressed to find folks who work harder for their clients than we do. We hire people who love what they do and consequently, they're relentless in their efforts. Problem solvers. It's ingrained in our culture to skip all the drama involved in blame and focus our energy on finding solutions. Professional. You can and should expect professionalism in all our demeanor and actions. 100% customer committed. We've grown our business through referrals, so we want to earn your enthusiasm, making you our very best marketing tool. Innovative. We will consistently seek out new, better ways to do things. And finally, and most important in my book, frankly, dependable and trustworthy. We are careful what we commit to because when we say we'll do it, our clients and coworkers can consider it done. So those are six core values that uh, I found quite attractive. Uh, and I will confess something to you, and that is that in 25 years now uh, of operation, the Dove Foundation does not have has not articulated a set of core values. Now we have a basis for our core values and the basis are two scriptures that we refer to and use frequently uh, in our board meetings and in our sales meetings. Uh, and that is Ephesians 2.10, uh, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have these treasures in earthen vessels, that is us, that the surpassing greatness of power may be of God and not from ourselves. A little lesson in humility. 
Now, we have talked uh, at Dove for many years about caring and about values and about family friendly and about trust uh, and about unconditional love, but we have never really sat down as an organization and laid out a set of core values. And so our first assignment, once we get back, uh, is going to be to do exactly that because we feel that it's that important. How many of you uh, in your organizations have articulated sets of core values? Well, you're being congratulated uh, because that's very important. And it's important that your core values be communicated not only internally, but externally as well. It's important for your people to know what it is that they're supporting and what direction they're going in and for the customer to know uh, as was stated earlier, not only what you do, but why you do it. And this brings me to the last uh, uh, issue, and that is the ultimate C. Uh, and for me, the ultimate C is Christ. Um, there's an old adage, and that is that a person with an argument is no match for a person with an experience. And uh, one good example of that was an 11-year-old boy uh, who, due to a catastrophe, was pronounced dead for uh, several hours uh, before he was revived, and he then was able to relate uh, some wonderful personal experiences about heaven. And uh, the book was written, was called Heaven is for Real, and it was later made into a motion picture. The interesting thing about this was that uh, the information that he had, that he was able to communicate, could not possibly not possibly have been acquired uh, by any natural means because he knew about things that were happening in France, um, totally disconnected to anything that he had. Uh, and if you, I don't want to do a spoiler, it's worth watching the movie or reading the book to find out exactly what the process is. It's a very easy read, but it's called Heaven is for Real by Todd Burpold. So. Taking the same principle that a person with an argument is no match for a person with an experience, I'm here to tell you that from my personal experience, Jesus is real. And when I say Jesus is real, I'm not talking about the historical Jesus of Nazareth. That's easy enough to prove. What I'm talking about is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is, for me, an ever-present help in trouble, as the Bible says he will be. In my own personal life, I was born and raised in a wonderful Christian home. Mom and dad loved the Lord. I, uh, Sunday morning was church, Sunday night was church, Wednesday night was prayer meeting, Thursday night after school was catechism, followed by choir practice. So uh, you can tell that I was pretty well engaged in the, in the process. But not only in the process, I really bought the the line that, uh, that they were talking about in church. I, I believed everything that I was told, that Jesus loved me uh, and that he would, he would always take care of me. Uh, and I lived that life, not perfectly. <laughs> I, I had my mischievous moments, shall we say. But <clears throat> I, I lived based on that premise my entire life uh, and until I was age 24. And at 24, I looked around and I had the perfect family. I had a daughter, three, and a son, a year old. Uh, I was married, happily married. I was returning to college, getting my degree, and everything was going along just peachy keen. Until one Sunday morning when we went to go to church, uh, we got my son dressed and I went back into the bedroom to get my daughter and she was unconscious. Couldn't revive her. I thought at first she had fallen asleep, but she was unconscious. I immediately called our family physician and he met us at the hospital. By the time we got to the hospital, she had revived and was alert. He had with him a, um, a neurologist uh, because he already had some suspicion about what might be wrong. And they put her through a series of tests and in very short notice, they had diagnosed her with a brain tumor. Unfortunately, after a year of struggle and in and out of the hospitals, she finally succumbed to that and she passed away at age four and a half. Um, her funeral was on Valentine's Day. 
So that was a very tragic thing for me, especially in the light of the uh, worldview that I had of Jesus. This Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Uh, he would never, ever do anything to hurt me. And yet here was the same Jesus who, in my mind, had taken away the most precious thing in my life. Well, unfortunately, my, my uh, faith wasn't as strong as the circumstance. And for the next 11 years, I decided to find another way. If God's way wasn't right, there had to be another way. So I spent the next 11 years pursuing wealth uh, and um, other types of appetites. And finally, uh, I found out that after 11 years, that life without Christ was really bad. It wasn't anything like life with Christ was. And so I made a decision after 11 years to give God another chance. And so I recommitted my life to him. And this was in 1980. And I can tell you that God is real, that Jesus died for my sins, that he is there when I need him. Uh, he has never left me or forsaken me. Um, I finally was able to process in my own brain that innocence suffers because of the, which is the evidence that evil exists. If innocence didn't suffer, then we wouldn't know about evil. And so with that, I was able to process what happened and also with the assurance of knowing that there will be a time when I will be reunited with my daughter again. So I just want to encourage you to, to think through what I've just shared with you and to imagine a life without Christ or a life with Christ. And if you've been on either side of those uh, issues, I encourage you and I would dare say that each one of you that has been on the side of a life with Christ would certainly uh, acknowledge and agree with me that that's the better life to live. Thank you very much. We want to, as, as Dick just pointed out, uh, introduce to each of you the most important decision you will ever make in this life or eternity for those that haven't made it. How to find peace with God. And perhaps you're, you're sitting here and you realize that you never made a Christian commitment. But don't delay that decision. We, we encourage you to embrace, embrace God's love today and receive the salvation, as Dick mentioned, that only Jesus Christ gives. And here are five simple steps uh, that you can take to assure, uh, to have the assurance and find the assurance of salvation. Number one, uh, recognize your need to begin with. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that uh, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners, and we must admit our need for a Savior. Number two, repent of your sins. Our sins create a wall that separates us from God, and by confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. And the Bible promises in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then believe in Jesus. Now God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die so that he could pay for all our sins. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And finally, receive his salvation. God has given us a great gift in his Son, but we must 
receive his gift and thank him for loving and forgiving you and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is very clear in John 1 12 as many as receive him to them he gave the right to become children of God. Through Jesus we have atonement. Uh, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. Through Jesus we have remission and that is as if we never sinned. <clears throat> and through Jesus we have forgiveness daily. Uh, you know we all have clay feet as, as Dick mentioned and uh, every day we can come to that cross of salvation and receive Christ's forgiveness. So having done this uh, we encourage you to confess your faith. Uh, the Bible assures us in Romans 10 9 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. And being born again, uh, becoming part of God's family, we want to encourage you to share that good news uh, with others. Now, as, as we leave here this morning, uh, or at the end of the day, and we do want to encourage all of you to stay uh, until three, 3 o'clock this afternoon for the entire summit, regardless of when we leave today, at some point in time, we're all going to die, and we're going to spend uh, eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. And so we want you to take this brochure with you, if you would, please. And we also want to give you an invitation of this morning. So we're going to ask at this time if uh, all heads would be bowed, please. We're going to, we're going to invite you to pray this prayer with us the most important decision that many of you will make in this life. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now, and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you that you love me, and I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord, and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family, and I commit my life to you from this day forward. 